Yeah.
that we are washed clean from all our sins. And that's the reason that we come here to praise you today, to, to turn our attention towards Christ, off of ourselves and off of trying to earn your favor, and instead of resting in the finished work of Christ. Yeah, uh, the theme this year is what fuels you, 
and uh, we're, we have a pretty amazing speaker this weekend. He might even speak today, we'll see. Um, yeah, so you, you should sign up if you haven't signed up yet. All right, guys. Courtney, do you know what happens to a human body when it's hit with two inches of foam at 40 miles per hour? I have no idea, Brian. Um, well, me neither, but we'll find out tonight at Grounds. It's Nerf or Grounds tonight. So, uh, yeah, go ahead and bring your your guns if you have some. Nerf or Guns. I know some of you that live on campus probably might not have it because but if you have any, bring them tonight. And if you don't have any, show up anyway. We'll have some for you. All right, coming up. Coming up on Tuesday, every Tuesday at U Hour, 12 to 1, we meet at the stables and we do prayer and share, where we meet up and then we go out around campus and talk to students about Jesus, main man. Um, so Tuesdays, U Hour, at the stables. All right. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Now it's time to introduce our speaker for today. So we have, we have a quick story about our speaker today. Yeah. So one time, he was uh, on a trip in South America. Unfortunate. And then he uh, decided to take a walk on the beach. What happened? You tell him what happened. Uh, he <laughs> then proceeded to swim in the ocean, which if you guys don't know, the sharks there uh, eat your hair and... <laughs> 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 we got nothing. All right. All what, right. Out, what happened after? So, so the shark digested his hair, and he never got it back. All right. So uh, let's uh, welcome up Brian Holland. <laughs> Bibles or your tablets or your phones or whatever. Um, for the next couple of hours, I just want to look at Judges chapter 17. I'm kidding. <laughs> All you A plus students are like, I'll lose my scholarship. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm gonna try to get out. I'm gonna be trying to be done by quarter 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 one. Will that work? Good. Yeah. All right. Wow, don't be so excited. <laughs> Let's pray, shall we? Jesus, I pray that you would. Uh, we're looking at a passage that I think a lot of us have looked at before, and it's so tempting to get into it, and I've heard this, and God, even as I preach it, and then preached it before, I go, I got this. And so Jesus revealed, revealed something new, exciting, hit us right where we're at, Holy Spirit, and then change us, and embrace us, and empower us to, to live um, the lives that you've called us to live. Completely reliant upon you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, how many guys ever heard this line? Hey, God will never give you more than you can handle. Heard that? Hey, don't worry about it, guys. God will never give you more than you can handle. Guys, the only problem with that statement is the Bible. <laughs> I normally like to encourage each other a little bit. I kind of like, I look at scripture and I go, there's a whole lot of people that seem to be going through a bunch of stuff that is more than they can handle. And someone say, oh, no, no, I disagree. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13? I know it says, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But then he provides a way out, which means this. If he didn't provide the way out, I couldn't handle it on my own. Isn't the Bible just filled with a bunch of passages and stories where we look at God having to come through because people are going through something that is beyond their ability to comprehend or beyond their ability to be able to handle on their own? And this is what happens. This is the temptation that we have as followers of Christ, that the longer you walk with Jesus, the easier it should, be, it, it should become, and then therefore I don't need Jesus anymore. Has anyone found it to be a little bit more opposite than that? The longer you walk with Jesus, the more you realize how much you suck. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. I mean, let me just let me just encourage you. I try to say this everywhere just to make sure people understand. You suck. And God gets it. Now here's the thing. He doesn't say, hey, just stay there in the world of suck. No, he wants you to move beyond that. But here's the thing. Guys, we are in complete 100%, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, reliance upon God in order to walk the life that he actually wants us to walk. So he's never asked us to live 
for him. He's asked us to live with him and by him so we can live for him. Does that make sense? So this is what happens. I don't know about you, but I put all the pressure on myself that God, watch what I do today. Watch what I do for you. And he's just going to sit back on his throne, just kind of chilling out because he's tired. Because he's been working for a long time. So he just chills out. I go, no, 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 just stay there. Watch what I do. And then I go up and I fail. Then I come back. Oh, okay, tomorrow. Tomorrow, brother. Today was not good. So I go back the next day. Guess what happens? Same thing. Back and forth, back and forth. And the whole time, what's he inviting us to? Hey, walk with me. It's the invitation to what? Discipleship. Friends, we don't need more Christians. We need more followers. We don't need more Christians. He said, well, what do you mean? We need more people who are disciples, who are followers of Jesus. Because can't you call yourself a Christian and kind of believe and do whatever you want nowadays? But Jesus never even used the word Christian. He never said, hey, go out and make Christians. He never used the word. It wasn't, a, it wasn't even used until after Jesus ascended. And it was a derogatory term used by people who weren't followers of Christ to make fun of those who were. And then we adopted the name. It's like, this is our game name. This is sweet. Like, what do we call ourselves? Oh, uh, well, I, I was called a Christian, which is kind of like synonymous with redneck. But let's just take that. That's good. <laughs> Followers of Jesus, let me encourage you. You cannot do it alone. And you have never been expected to. Judges chapter 7 starts with this, verse 1. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early in a camp beside the spring of Herod, and the, and the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of, of, of Morah in, in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Now just stop there for just a second. I don't know about you, but I feel like if I'm going into battle, there's never too many. Right? If I'm going to go fight, especially when you look at the description, there's people that they're going to fight, it's like, okay, it's like locusts across the land. And so you have your people. And God goes, that's too many. There's no such thing as too many. We should take everyone. We should take every man, woman, child. Let the infants play. It doesn't matter. Just go for it. Whoever will come and fight, let's be part of that. And God goes, this is too many. And he gives the reason. Lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So imagine you're Gideon. You're like, okay, I'll tell him, but I'm telling you, God, these are all warriors. Hey, if any of you are freaking out, just go ahead and go home. Thank God, okay, I'll see you later. <laughs> and then they don't go. And it's not like just a couple. You see two-thirds of your army leave. And at one point you just sit there and go, oh, are you kidding me? That's, that's everyone. You look at your best, but that's all we were buddies. I don't want to die today for you. And then he goes home. How many would feel discouraged? And then you say, okay, then that's it. Because this is almost, I mean, this is almost impossible. So God, there's no way that you're going to ask anything else. And we'll get to verse 4. And the Lord said again, and the people are still too many. Are you kidding me? Is it, is it God's hobby, hobby just to freak us out? Like he's just sitting in heaven and going, Seraphim, hey, come here, come here. And they're all, they're all on fire. Yeah, yeah. And tell them, hey, watch this. Watch what I'm about to do to Brian. We love when you do that to Brian. <laughs> he freaks out every time. I know. It's happened that all of heaven just come around. All the worship stops as God goes, this is going to be sick. <laughs> Here's what God says to Gideon. The people are still too many. Take them down to the water. And I, will, I will test them for you. Well, that's nice of God, isn't it? It's like, oh, there's too many. But I'll do the work. I'll get your army all ready. This, I'll, I'll test them for you down there. Anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who left, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300. This is a weird test to find warriors, isn't it? I, think, I would be sitting there listening to God going, are you kidding me? You're going to find the guys that can fight in a battle by how they drink? How about a sword? No, I don't know about that. No, I kind of need to worry about that. That's part of the, you know, that's part of the process of fighting. You're like, you're in a battle, and you kind of want to be able to have a sword and not stop and go, wait! Ah, you want some of this? It's not how it works! 
So God's like, no, this is what we're going to do. The number of those who were putting their hands in their mouth was 300, which is a weird way to drink, I kind of think. It's like liver laps are like a dog, so 300 are like, oh, I'll drink. Like, this is this I've never in my life drank water like that. But <laughs> that little puppy is just going crazy. So 300 are put to the side, but all the rest of the people knelt down to drink. And here's what's funny. I'll read commentaries, and you'll get commentators who go, do you know why this is? Do you know why God picked the 300 over here and not the people that knelt down? Here's the reason behind it. I'm like, where does it say that? The ones who knelt down could, didn't totally trust God because they knelt down thinking, you're so full of it. Like, you, you get paid by the word because this is crap. Because <laughs> it doesn't say, okay? So I have no reason. Sometimes God just does what he wants and doesn't tell us why. Verse 7, and the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. Can you imagine just standing there being Gideon? Here comes dog lapper number one. <laughs> he just sitting there going, over there. <laughs> no one's going to give me those guys. I don't want to do this. I have 10,000 and all of a sudden, one and then four this direction. One, 407 this direction. And you're just sitting there going, I know what you're going to do. You're going to jack up my life with a 300. <laughs> Separates them and then says, hey, tell the 9,700, tell them they can go home. Then at any point in this passage, does it sound like God says, I'll never give you more than you can handle? Or does he say, man, you sure had enough. I'm going to freak the crap out of you. A lot. It sure seems like God's putting him into something that is more than he can handle, isn't that? So you get to verse, verse 9. That same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. There you go. Just go. Okay, there's this massive army. You got your 300. Just go down. The camp's yours. They've already given it to you. Oh, okay, sure. Just walk in. What do you do? Ask. Hey, I'm supposed to have your camp things. I'm supposed to beat you. Could you just kill each other? And then we're good to go. There's 300. Do you want some of this? <laughs> <laughs> but did you, notice, did you notice how calm God is about it? Just watch what he says. Arise, get up, go down against the camp, for I have given it in your hand. I, it's already happened. It's taken care of. Do you know what that connects us to with, with regards to God's character? It's his sovereignty. Guys, one of, the, one of the most comforting characteristics of God is his sovereignty. Because he's say, I've already worked this out. You're just catching up. So for those of you sitting there going, okay, I'm here this quarter. I have no clue how I'm going to pay the next one. But you feel, you sense that God has led you here. Guys, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. He's lived out your tomorrow. He's lived out your next week. He's lived out your life. He knows how he's going to get you to where he wants you to be. It's his sovereignty that brings me the most comfort. And he makes this promise. Guys, and the promises in Scripture are all yes. According to the New Testament, they're all yes in Jesus. When God makes a promise, it is done. It's not as good as done. It is done. He says, so get up. Go down, take the camp. I've given the camp into your hand. But if you're afraid, I'll say, God. This isn't getting the one kind of gets afraid every once in a while, gets a, little, gets a little nervous. Sure he is. But if you're afraid to go down and go down the camp with pure, your servant, which that makes much more sense to alleviate your pain and your worry. If you're afraid to go down with the 300, then go down with one. What? <laughs> If you're afraid, go with pure, go with one, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward, your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. So he went down with pure. What does that one line mean? He went down with pure means, what about Gideon? He was afraid. I love the Bible. Because I'd always sit around going, I'm not afraid of anything. Except if that happens. <laughs> and except when that happens. So we think that every single situation you go up against, like, I'm not afraid. I know Jesus. I know Jesus. <laughs> and then we remember Jesus when he's in the boat with the disciples and they're going across, he's sleeping. And the storm kicks in and the water starts to come in the boat. I don't know if you know about it. I'm, 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 I'
I was down in South America with a shirt. I'm just like, I'm like, I don't know anything about boats, but water on the outside is, outside is fantastic, and water on the inside is not a good day. So there's Jesus sleeping, and the disciples are in the very presence of God in the boat. There's Jesus sleeping on the boat. They see him do the miraculous, and yet all of a sudden they become what? Terrified. So just because you know God does not mean the fear is going to come. It's not going to come. It just means what are you going to do when the fear comes? You have a choice. So they have to come up running to Jesus and wake him up. This is how they wake him up. Don't you care if we drown? That's a great way to wake someone up, especially with God. <laughs> you don't even know if Jesus gets grumpy when he wakes up. It's like, don't you care? No. <laughs> Turns him into a pig and goes back to <laughs> The thing with those words, don't you care? Don't we say the same thing when the crisis hits? God, don't you care? I mean, the junk hits, and we go, God, where did you go? Don't you care? And then Jesus gets up and goes, why are you guys freaking out? Which is a weird question. Because he's standing with water in the boat. Why are you guys freaking out? Oh, it's kind of obvious. <laughs> Why are you guys freaking out? I forgot my sandwich. How would you not know? And then he looks at wind and waves and says, shut up. That's in the Greek. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> then what happens? The wind goes, and the water becomes like glass. And they're what? Terrified. Wouldn't you be? I don't think you'd be calling your phones going, what? God. <laughs> Hashtag what the? <laughs> <laughs> Terrified, right? So God says, hey, if you're afraid, get if you're afraid, take pure now. Take pure. Can you can't imagine pure going, no! Can you whisk with all of us? Oh, I, I hate the thing we're born. He goes for it. Now watch this. Then he went down, pure his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Many knights and the Malachites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. Outnumbered? Yeah. I'm thinking locusts in abundance is huge. And their camels were without number. All the camels on the planet were there. <laughs> or he's just being descriptive. Okay, so, as the sand is on the seashore in abundance, when Gideon and Kate, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrades. So imagine, Gideon's going up. You're, okay, we did this when I was little. I don't know if he did that. It may just because we were bored and had nothing else to do, but it, my brother and I and a buddy across the street, we like to spy, which sounds a lot like stalking. But <laughs> maybe I don't want to tell this story. Okay. No, but right across the street at this older person's house, they would do all the voting polls. Okay? They would open their house and have voting polls. And so at, we knew when it was happening, so we put on these headsets that turned into like walkie-talkies, and we had our fake guns, <laughs> and we would sneak in their backyard. And we would peek through the window. Yeah, y'all don't. I don't know if you guys want to come to retreat now. I don't do it anymore. <laughs> back in the day. And it was just fun because you kind of got around. Now, I kind of pictured Gideon like this. Gideon and Pure just kind of going, oh, why are we here? We're in the enemy camp. And they come up and they're kind of trying to listen because God says, you will hear something that's going to encourage you to go forth what it is that I'm saying. So all of a sudden they show up to this tent. Random, right? We, we call it coincidence rather than God. We call it coincidence. Oh. That was a coincidence. I can't believe you're here right now. What a coincidence. And I think God said to heaven one, gosh, do I ever get any credit? I mean, they give, they give credit to healing to NyQuil, but not to me. They give credit to coincidence, which is an idea with no personality, rather than God divinely appointing times for us to do and to hear what it is that he wants. So they show up. You hear this? This is what the guy says, behold just, I always study something. Like, behold. If I look at my boys, behold, it's time for dinner. Behold. <laughs> behold, I dreamed a dream. And it's like a song or a musical. Behold, I'm not going to sing. And behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent, struck it so that it fell, and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. It's a picture. Freaking me out in my dream. I saw a barley bread. It's got to be a massive barley <laughs> rolling down the hill. <laughs> then it jumped, nailed the tent. The tent collapsed, turned upside down, and boom! This is the friend. Oh, no. 
Here's the, here's, here's the interpretation. Okay? This is no other than the sword of the Gideon. The son of Joash, a man of Israel, God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. You ask me a question, how in the crud do you get to that interpretation? <laughs> how do you see a barley loaf? I'm listening. No, not barley. <laughs> Did you see barley loaf? Yeah, it was rolled. Okay, keep coming, keep coming. And then it hit the, it hit the tent. Okay, that's Gideon. <laughs> An Israelite is just going to come and destroy us. Well, that's a cruddy dream. <laughs> Actually, have you ever had one of those weird dreams? It's like you're just there, and all of a sudden you talk to your friend, and they take off their face. <laughs> and a shark who eats your hair. <laughs> oh, you know what that means? That means I'm supposed to go tell someone about Jesus. Yes. <laughs> I look at this and I go, are you kidding? Like, how do you come away with this? But if you're getting, what are you thinking? As you're listening to the dream, you're going, dang, that's a weird dream. And then I picture Gideon doing something like this. Did he just say my name? Did he just say that the camp has been given to me? Oh, dang. What did Gideon do? Watch his response. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. Two words. Worship everything changed. See, God gave this promise, and then God knew Gideon, you're not going to believe me. So I'll give you something. Most people will call it a coincidence, but I'm going to call it me. And you're going to get to go hear someone tell a dream, and honestly, it makes no connection to the interpretation that you're going to hear. But the interpretation is going to be so personal to you that it's going to cause you to what? Stand in the middle of the enemy camp and worship. Not walk down because you're terrified, but to stand in the middle of the enemy camp and worship God. Why? Because you believe the promise that has already been made because God has confirmed the promise to you. You know what the promises of God cause us to do? It causes us to stop and to worship in the middle of the crisis. It causes us to hopefully see from a different perspective that maybe God in His sovereignty, His love, His care, concern, His grace and mercy. That maybe God had, does have a plan that when it doesn't make sense, God, I had this and now I don't. Why would you do this? You ever notice how much we pray for a miracle, but then we ask God to take away the pathway that ushers us into the front row seat of the miraculous? Because you really don't need a miracle unless the crisis is, isn't it true? I don't need a miracle when things are great. I'm just hoping it continues. Like, oh, I've got plenty. Oh, please, God, let that continue. I'm not saying, God, I'm so freaked out. I have plenty. Could you please do a miracle that I would have plenty of? <laughs> You ask for miracles, and we ask God to take away the pathway that leads us to see the miraculous And there's a problem with that, guys. Either God is sovereign or he isn't. And someone say, what about this? When this happened in my family or this happened to me. And guys, we could go around the room and say all those things. And guys, we've all hit crisis, haven't we? We've all had at least one crisis in our life. We sit there, and we say something just like the disciples. Like, God, don't you care? Don't you care? I mean, this is, I'm supposed to be, I'm striving to live with, by, and for you. And I'm going through this, and I look over there, and they can care less about you. And their life looks perfect. God, why? There's the weird thing in Scripture. There's not a lot of times it doesn't seem like it where God actually will answer the question of why. Or how long. You ever notice that? I think it's the reason, I think this is the reason we don't like, we wouldn't like to answer to either one of those. What if God said this, Brian, you're going through this, and it has nothing to do with you. You're going through this because one day, two years from now, you're going to meet this guy over in this area in this hospital room because of what you're going through. And they're going to come to know Jesus because of the pain that you're experiencing. Do we really like the answer to the why? Unless we come to a point where we look at Jesus and say, my life, everything about me belongs to you. God, whatever you want to do with this, do with this. And how long? What if God says, oh, okay, if you want the answer. Today is the beginning of 21 years. We don't like that answer. It's like, did you say 21 minutes? You said 21 minutes, right? No. It's going to be hard for 21 years. But he would never 
do that. Jeremiah preached for how long? 50 years and never saw one person come back. Never saw one person come back to God. We don't like the answers, but can't we trust the one who knows what the answer is? He always comes back to it. Do I trust him? Gideon heard the promise, couldn't believe it, heard the confirmation of the promise and worshiped in the middle of the enemy camp. Guys, when we hit the crisis, do we believe the promises that God gives us? Well, you said him, you said that the one that he says will he'll never give you more than you can handle. Oh, I, I do believe that that's not true. But I will promise you this, that there's a God who says, I will walk with you. And you will walk with me. And I am with you in all. How do I know? Isn't that the thing that Jesus said? Go make disciples, baptize and teach them to obey all that I command you. And by the way, I'll be with you. I'm with you always. To the very end of the age. You go from this and all of a sudden, this, this is how he goes back. He goes back, looks at his men and says, guys, we're taking the camp. He's, he's convinced. So he passes out what? And trumpets. And he's sitting there going, How the heck are you going to win that? It's like, You want some of this? <laughs> Man, I don't know. It doesn't say, God didn't say, Give him trumpets and torches. It doesn't say it. Gideon comes up with it. Maybe he saw him fight before. He's like, Let me see what you guys think. He's like, Here's a torch. <laughs> You, uh, here's a trumpet, but that's true. <laughs> puts him in, he puts them in groups of three, hundred each. He says, when you hear me say this, then I want you to break open the torch to let the light shine and then just blow your trumpets. Say it for the Lord and for Gideon. Why for that and for Gideon? Because the dream probably was spreading among the camp. The dream was this, that this is Gideon and he's come to destroy the camp. So all of a sudden he makes the noise, screams out, everyone breaks open. There's the torch shining. It says, for the Lord and for Gideon. And then guess what happens? The Midianites just they get up and they start beating the crap out of each other. That's a sick movie. <laughs> <laughs> just sit around. Wow! You just sit down, grab some corn, pop it with your torch. <laughs> And the Midianites, he finally got it. Okay, the Midianites are delivered in the hands of what? 300 guys? Why? Because God sent us. Arise, go down against the camp. I have given it into your hand. Friends, can I encourage you to say, we should be striving to live lives where we wait to hear the promise of God and then go in full confidence of it rather than trying to declare what God's promises should be, never asking his opinion, moving forward and then asking God to bless us for our disobedience for never asking his opinion in the first place. You want certainty of victory? Do what he says. Rather than asking him, just, well, clean up my mess. God, I don't really don't know if this was you, but hopefully it will be. So, can you just do something? And wait, God, whatever you want. However you want. So will God give you more than you can handle? Yes. He definitely will. But the end result, guys, read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and you'll see it. Paul says, I was, we were overwhelmed to the point of death. We couldn't handle it. But we did this. God did this. He put this in our lives so that we might rely on him. That was the purpose. God never wants us far on Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much that you give us more than we can handle. Thank you that you can handle it. Thank you for handling it. God be with these students. Use them in an incredible way on their mission to feel right here on this campus. May this place never be the same because of your anointing on them. May students come to know you this, this year because of their obedience and faithfulness to you. Empower us, go with us as we engage the mission we call us to. God, we pray this in Jesus' name and everyone who agrees says. Amen. Amen. I'll see you guys tomorrow for this. Have a good one. All right, guys, really quick before you leave, uh, can we just thank Brian again for. Brian! Just how sovereign guys.
where are we going to lunch today? Oh, today, instead of going off campus for lunch, we're going to do picnic style. So get anywhere on campus, and then we're going to go to the lawn outside of Denny's, like across the bike path, and we're just all going to picnic out there. So we'll be out there in like 10, 15 minutes. Awesome, guys. Yeah. See you. Have a great week. <laughs> What are you leaving? Um,